Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to APIX 2020. This is our first plenary session uh, one. So today we are very fortunate to have Professor Yasin Arabi. I think Professor Arabi does not require very much introduction. He will be speaking today on the update of MERV COVID therapeutics implications for COVID-19. Professor Yasin Arabi works in the King Saudi bin Abdullah Aziz University for Health Sciences in, the, in Saudi Arabia. He obtained his internal medicine training where he was the chief medical resident at Wayne State University, Detroit in America from 1992 to 1995. He subsequently went on to complete his pulmonary and critical care training at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Uh, from 1995 to 1998. He is currently the chairman of the intensive care department, the medical director, respiratory services, and professor King Saud bin Abdullah Aziz University for Health Sciences, King Abdullah International Medical Research Center. Professor Arabi is currently the principal investigator, co investigator on several multi center randomized controlled trials. He has been involved in MERS as well as COVID 19 research. He has more than 300 publications, including articles in leading medical journals, and is currently a section editor for the intensive care medicine on the, and on the editorial board of several journals. He has received multiple grants and awards, including the Barry A. Shapiro Memorial Award for Excellence in Critical Care Management, Society Care of Critical Care Medicine in 2011. So welcome, Professor Yasin Arambi, and uh, you may your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee, for this kind introduction. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to be with you here today. You can see my slide? Yes, we can. OK, excellent. So I'll be giving an update on MERS-CoV therapeutics and uh, briefly on implications for COVID-19. Um, this is my disclosures. I don't have any financial disclosures related to the topic, but have done some consultation on certain aspects of therapeutics for MERS. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on the clinical trial that was published in the final uh, version in the New England Journal of Medicine two days ago which is the miracle trial. In this trial, we studied the effect of interferon beta 1b and lupinavir ritonavir for the Middle East respiratory syndrome. Just to put things in perspective, MERS has been first described in 2012. And since then, there have been around 2,500 cases leading to around 850 uh, deaths with a case fatality rate of 34%. And what you could see here that over the last uh, eight or nine years, there have been surges of cases periodically, but generally the cases have been um, low in the last few years and declining. So by all means, this is a relatively uncommon disease, very severe disease, but uncommon. It has been described in 27 countries, but 85% of the cases were in Saudi Arabia. The disease uh, is caused by a coronavirus, MERS-CoV, and causes severe respiratory uh, infection, uh, an ARDS, and also cause multi-organ uh, involvement. It has similarities to SARS and COVID-19 um, and, and several aspects, but um, there are some differences as well. It is generally more severe. Um, this uh, disease is uh, acquired from camels, but also human to human transmission happen, and also transmission within healthcare facilities has been a major uh, problem. So mortality among MERS patients who are critically ill, who are admitted to our ICUs, and um, I have treated many of these patients, have higher high mortality, around 67%. And compared to a cohort of a non-MERS severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome, uh, where the mortality is 35%, you immediately recognize the higher mortality. Uh, just for comparison, the mortality rate for ICU patients admitted to our ICU 
with COVID-19 is around 25%. So again, there are similarity in clinical manifestations, but generally severe uh, overwhelming disease. Now, the interest in interferon with the MERS has uh, been going for several years. Uh, interferon uh, has been shown to have inhibitory effect to MERS. And um, uh, it appears that MERS-CoV is more sensitive than SARS-CoV to interferon effect. So in our body, interferon is part of the immune response to um, to mers cov Interestingly, MERS, the virus itself, inhibits interferon responses. So it inhibits its own defense mechanism. And uh, therefore, the idea of giving interferon as therapeutic has emerged. Among the interferons, it appeared to be, in, based on in vitro studies, that interferon beta has the strongest inhibition of mers cov in a marmoset model, in animal model, where animals were treated or infected with the virus, and then were treated with interferon beta 1b or lupinavir or, um, um, or mycophenolate or untreated, the animals that were treated with interferon beta 1b and lupinavir had better clinical, radiological, and pathological and viral outcomes compared to those who were untreated. And in fact, short-term mortality at 36 hours was um, lower in the animals that were treated with interferon compared to those uh, which were untreated. Data on lupinavir, ritonavir, um, when we started the trial was based mainly on SARS. And there's, there's little data. There's small case series of 41 patients with lupinavir, ritonavir, treated with lupinavir, ritonavir, compared to um, historical co control. And uh, the study demonstrated large difference in mortality and adverse outcomes with lupinavir. And in fact, in high throughput screening for antiviral compounds, the lupinavir inhibited the replication of MERS-CoV at levels that are easily achievable by therapeutic dose of lupinavir, ritonavir. Therefore, we planned the uh, conduction of the miracle trial, which is the, a trial that tested a combination of interferon beta 1b and lupinavir ritonavir compared to placebo on 90 day mortality in patients who are hospitalized with confirmed MERS. We published the protocol and published the statistical analysis plan ahead of the final analysis. So when we plan the study, uh, this is kind of a unique study because we are dealing with a relatively uncommon problem. And when we started the trial, we did not have enough information about the effect size that um, might happen with lupinavir, ritonavir, and interferon. And this type of estimate is important when we plan the um, large trial to calculate the sample size. This information did not exist. And in such case, you would normally try to do a pilot study and gain some information from the pilot study to, um, uh, to, pl to plan the larger trial. But when you have a rare disease, this becomes a challenge. You don't wanna, you wanna use all the information you can get from all patients. And therefore we plan the study in uh, something called adaptive two-stage recursive RCT. And this type of design is designed as two stages at least, but it can be more stages, and where um, you gain some information about the effect size from the first stage, and you plan the sample size accordingly. And in this also, this design, we had a futility boundary. So in other words, if you do the first stage, recruited 34 patients in our trial, and we found that the study is futile. There's, if it met futility boundaries, then at, we had a low threshold for futility. So we don't need to keep going with the trial when uh, chances of um, uh, unsuccessful outcome is there. And therefore, we can move on to test another, another trial, another, another therapeutic. The advantage of this is that when you have a low 
a futility, low threshold for futility boundary, it gives you a gain in the power. This is related to the statistical aspects of the trial. Gives you more power over the traditional approach. Um, so that's, that's, that's a big advantage for the trial. So it's a recursive two-stage group sequential randomized control trial. We planned it to be multi-center. And in fact, this is the only way to do it because the cases are uncommon and sporadic in different sites. We did it as a double blind study and we thought this is important to have a double blind study in a small clinical trial uh, to avoid confounding. Um, we, ran, we stratified randomization according to the site and also to whether the patient was requiring mechanical ventilation at the time of enrollment. We uh, used concealed randomization and we followed a pragmatic approach in terms of co-interventions, um, which were at the discretion of the treating team. And the advantage of this um, are related to in, in enhancing enrollment and mimicking the real life experience. We included uh, patients who are 18 year old or older who have a confirmed MERS infection and have some organ dysfunction that was judged to be related to MERS, hypoxia, for example, hypotension, renal impairment. What we wanted is to include patients who have sufficient symptoms related to MERS. We did not want to include patients who were asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic um, that might have been admitted to the hospital for infection control purposes. We want to include clinically significant disease. We had a list of exclusion criteria, which are really related to the um, possible side effects of the drugs, kind of the standard ones. So patients who, were, uh, who have confirmed more MERS were randomized to receive lupinavir, ritonavir, 400 milligram um, twice daily as tablets. And if the patient cannot swallow tablets, so for example, has empty tube, we give suspension. And um, uh, in addition, this is given for two weeks. In addition, these patients got interferon beta 1b injection every other day for a total of seven days. That's for 14 days. The placebo group um, received sucrose capsules or normal saline twice daily or, uh, and received a placebo injection every alternative day. And that was the patients were monitored um, for the primary outcome, which is 90 day mortality. We had a list of uh, secondary outcomes, um, death at different time points, ICU, hospital and 28 day mortality, days uh, alive and free from supplemental oxygen, free from mechanical ventilation, renal replacement therapy. Also we had, we looked at length of stay and we looked at serial uh, SOFA scores. We also assess virological outcome, including the time to clearance from MERS, COVID RNA, also serial CT values. We also looked at functional outcome, assessed by Karnofsky performance status score. We looked at safety outcomes, including serious adverse events and adverse events, uh, which were graded according to a common terminology system. So the plan the study was first proposed in 2015. We got the um, necessary approvals in 2016. And by the end of 2016, we started enrolling patients. Um, and you could see here on the lower panel, the number of patients we recruited relatively reflecting the low number of sites we initially had and the number of um, the relatively low number of cases that were happening in bars are the number of sites that are active. The active sites are the light gray and the blue, um, dark blue are the sites that were active but uh, never had a case that were recruited. Um, in 2018, we start to move uh, to uh, deploy a mobile research team to the, some of the new sites that are in other cities to uh, enable initiation of the, of the trial procedures. In 2019, there was the first interim analysis as planned. And in 2020, we had an unplanned interim analysis 
uh, based on the DSMB request. The trial was sponsored by King Abdullah International Medical Research, and I'm very grateful to their uh, fantastic support. So um, this map shows the map of Saudi Arabia and the distribution of sites, five cities, nine sites that recruited patients. And by the end of the trial, we had a very efficient system. In fact, in 2020, we recruited almost 67% of all patients who were diagnosed in Saudi Arabia and, uh, um, and were hospitalized. So we were able to catch all the patients, uh, especially towards the end of the trial, um, um, reflecting the system of, of notification. So the first interim analysis was uh, conducted in 2019, uh, and that's when uh, 34 patients had completed 90 days of follow-up as planned, and the DSMB recommended to continue the trial and re-estimated the sample size to be 114. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the DSMB called for unplanned interim analysis on March 2020, and um, uh, felt that the information gained from the trial might be important for COVID-19. And at that time, the uh, DSMB statistician calculated the conditional power um, and found to be 82%, which exceeded the planned power of 80%. In addition, the treatment effect did not cross the stopping futility boundaries in both interim analyses and the effect size observed independently from the first and second interim analysis consistently favored the treatment. And therefore, the DSMB recommended that the miracle trial terminate subject enrollment and proceed with uh, analyzing and reporting the results in a peer-reviewed journal. So um, a few important points relate to the statistical analysis of this trial. Uh, the 90-day outcome or mortality in each uh, trial group was a combined estimate from the first and second interim analysis weighted by the inverse variance of each estimate. This to, uh, to incorporate the adaptive design of the trial. The primary outcome analysis was one-sided and a type one error of 2.5%. And the upper boundary of the 97.5% confidence interval and p-value were calculated. All other analyses were two-sided and a type with a type one error of 5%. We adjusted for multiple testing using the false discovery rate. So we screened to, for the trial 182 patients. Uh, and again, for a uh, relatively uncommon disease, this is a large number of patients. Um, 124 were eligible, 96 were randomized eventually, and uh, 52 in the placebo group, 44 in the uh, active treatment group. There was one patient that withdrew consent, so we ended up with 43 versus 52 patients that were un un that, uh, who underwent the intention to treat analysis. I selected only a few of the baseline characteristics to just to reflect the uh, similarity between the two uh, groups. So uh, age was on average around 56 year old, um, around um, 75, 80% of the patients were males. Um, Apache was around 20, SOFA score was six, Karnofsky score, which is the higher the better, was similar between the two groups. Uh, one third of the patients were on the ward at the time of enrollment and two thirds were in the ICU. Around 40% were mechanically ventilated at the time of enrollment. And there were patients or, who were on uh, organ support at the time of enrollment. The, uh, we were able to give the intervention uh, successfully in, uh, for all practical purposes. So the number of interferon doses were uh, a median of seven doses as planned really in two groups. Um, in the lupinavir, ritonavir doses were 27 versus 26. This is a 14 day course. So the plan is 28 doses. Most patients received it. Uh, there, uh, the reasons why some patients did not got the uh, full course is because of either uh, patient died early or left the hospital early or developed elevation of liver enzymes and it was held. 
but for all practical purposes, patients receive almost a full course. Uh, the time to, uh, from onset to randomization is a seven day, and this is an important number to keep in mind to the end of the presentation. We were able to enroll patients relatively quickly after diagnosis, on average one day, or on a median of one day from confirmation with PCR. So this is a primary outcome in the intervention group, uh, 12 patients uh, out of 43 died, and in the placebo, 23 out of 52. Uh, and the primary analysis that accounts for the accounts for the adaptive design, this resulted in a, a risk reduction or risk difference of minus 19% from 20, 48 to 29% with upper boundary of 97 percentile of minus 3% with a one-sided p-value of 0 0.024. Now, if had we did this analysis using just a traditional z-test, with um, then the um, relative the risk reduction will be minus 16% with the upper boundary will cross one, which will be plus 3% with one-sided p-value 0 0.05. This is just to illustrate the gain of power from the adaptive design. And I think that was important to, um, for, for this uh, trial um, to help in, in gaining power uh, and gain all the information possible from the cohort. This is the kaplan meyer curve shows separation between the two groups. And you could see that the um, group continued to separate uh, until day 90, really. So uh, using uh, short-term outcomes, like many of the trials um, now using in the pandemic of uh, COVID-19, might have missed the treatment effect. Um, and in very sick group of patients, and like our ICU patients, very often the mortality happened later because of the consequences of, of the organ dysfunction. This is an important slide which showed the predefined subgroup analyses. There are five subgroups. The most important, the one different, uh, is the time from onset to symptoms. And it clearly it appears that patients who receive the treatment within seven days had significant reduction in mortality with a relative risk of 0.19 uh, with confidence interval that does not cross, um, does not cross one. While patients who receive treatment late more than seven days, the uh, relative risk is 1.18 with a confidence interval that cross one. The p-value for interaction was highly significant, 0 0.006. Um, and even after adjustment for um, multiple testing with um, FDR, uh, it remains significant. So it appears that if this treatment is given early in the course of the disease, then uh, the treatment will be effective in reducing mortality. Giving the treatment late does not make a difference. There was no difference based on severity, no heterogeneity based on severity, where the patient mechanically ventilated, on pressors, renal replacement therapy, etc. This is a kaplan meyer curve for patients who are treated within seven days, big separation between the two groups, while the patients who were received more than seven days, there was no difference. The secondary outcomes were all in the same direction like the primary outcome. Of course, our trial was not designed or powered sufficiently to look at all these secondary outcomes, but you could see, for example, days out of the ICU were nine days median versus zero day in the placebo group. Kornofsky score is higher numerically, although not statistically significant. Interestingly, we found that there is no difference in the time of to clearance of MR, uh, MERS uh, RNA from sputum, there was no difference in the CT values uh, between the two groups. Uh, serious adverse events were numerically fewer in patients in the intervention group, 9% versus 19%, with relative risk of 0.5, suggesting that, for example, this number one was elevated liver enzymes that these were related to the underlying severe disease rather than relate to the treatment. So treatment actually reduced this. So main findings that among hospitalized patients with MERS treatment with the recombinant interferon beta 1b and lupinavir resulted in lower mortality than placebo. And the treatment effect was observed mainly in patients who were treated within seven days 
after symptom onset, but not with later initiation of therapy. Does this biologically make sense? Yes, uh, there are um, uh, several studies shows that interferon given early, this is an mouse model uh, with mers cov interferon given within one day protected mice from lethal infection, while giving uh, interferon later failed to be effective and, um, and actually enhanced, worsened the cytokine expression. Similar study has been shown uh, in SARS, early interferon beneficial, late interferon not beneficial. Relevance to COVID-19, we don't know exactly really. Uh, this um, this uh, trial from China on lupinavir, tenavir, um, showed no difference. It was 199 patients, hospitalized patients, but the median time from symptom onset was 13 days. Uh, so much later than our trial. Uh, the mortality, in fact, uh, could argue that it's in favor of the treatment, although not significant. ICU length of stay was shorter, but not significant. Um, and um, serious adverse events were also fewer with lupinivir, um, but um, um, did not reach statistical significance. The recovery trial uh, had uh, stopped enrolling in lupinivir ritonivir, as you know, but only 4% of uh, patients were mechanically ventilated and subsequently WHO stopped enrollment in lupinivir. The trial from the recovery was just published in Lancet, um, showing again almost identical curves um, um, with lupinivir ritonivir in COVID-19. So uh, these different viruses, are they, is this related to different viruses? Is it related to the combined therapy? Is it related to the timing of treatment that we are seeing differences? All these are, I think, open questions at this point. How about interferon? Uh, interferon in COVID-19 also has been shown to um, maybe important in the pathogenesis. And in fact, um, uh, two recent papers in science uh, showed that patients who would, with life-threatening COVID-19 have um, uh, um, frequently have inborn errors of type 1 uh, interferon. And some patients with life-threatening uh, COVID-19 have autoimmune, uh, auto, auto antibodies against interferon uh, subtypes, mainly alpha, uh, less commonly interferon beta. So again, suggesting this rationale for interferon in COVID-19. There have been four uh, trials. Uh, one trial uh, using interferon beta with rapivirin and lupinivir in mild diseases and showed alleviation of symptoms and reduction in the duration of RNA detection. Uh, this was given early. There are two other trials, clinical trials on severe, showed some benefit. They have some methodological issues. There is a recent trial that was published in a press release of using inhaled interferon, showed lower in, in mild to moderate COVID, showed lower pro risk of proje uh, progression to severe disease. On the other side, the recovery, oh, sorry, the solidarity trial results were just published, uh, or not published, uh, they are pre-print uh, available. Uh, and showed that interferon was not effective in COVID-19. And in fact, if anything, it looks like it's worse outcome with interferon. Uh, the, what's missing, uh, wh what we don't know in the solidarity is the time from onset of symptoms. This information is not available. And whether this interferon treatment was late treatment, this information we don't know. Another important aspect to talk about interferon is a possible interferon uh, interaction between interferon and corticosteroids. And this uh, concern was raised by the interest trial, uh, which is an interferon beta 1b uh, trial in ARDS. And it showed um, in a post hoc analysis that uh, using interferon with steroids resulted in higher mortality, and uh, using interferon without steroids had no difference, um, and sub supported later by. Um, uh, showing that um, hydrocortisone inhibits interferon beta signaling. So basically, steroids inhibit, block the effect of interferon. So maybe, is not, maybe it's not a good idea, maybe. 
However, we, when we looked at our clinical trial, uh, we looked at in possible interaction. We did not find an interaction. In fact, the p-value for interaction is 0.98. So effectively, the, uh, the patients who received steroids or did not receive steroids, the effect of interferon and lipinavir was exactly the same. If you look, point estimate is almost identical, 0 0.6, 0 0.61. So strength of our study was adaptive design, pragmatic approach. We had a 90 day outcome. And as, as I explained, uh, um, uh, mortality continued to diverge beyond day 28, which is important. Uh, we used lupinavir suspension in patients who were unable to swallow tablets. Majority of patients received full course of therapy. Limitation, uh, early termination of the trial may have reduced the power, although the DSMB and uh, uh, the statistician have calculated and um, uh, uh, estimated that reaching the sample size of 114 um, uh, would not have added much to the um, trial power. And if logistically, this would have needed at least another year to get the enrollment. Uh, we did not have uh, sufficient power uh, to detect differences in secondary analyses. And one of the inherent problems with that design, they may overestimate the treatment effect. So in summary, a combination of uh, interferon beta-1b and lupinivir, tunivir, reduced mortality in patients with MERS. And the effect was greatest when treatment started within seven days of symptom onset. Big thanks to King Abdullah International Medical Research Center for supporting the trial with all the departments that helped tremendously in getting this through. And to the DSMB, Dr. Craig Martin, David Schoenfeld, um, Sharon Walsenley, and uh, Shannon Carson, and all the participating sites who've done a phenomenal job in getting this trial. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Arabi. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? I think this is a very interesting study that uh, you've presented of uh, the use of interferon as well as the combination of lupinavir as well as lupinavir. Um, perhaps I could start off uh, by asking, do you have any personal experience in using this combination therapy in patients with COVID-19? Uh, good question. So um, in our hospital, we are participating in the uh, clinical trial uh, called remap cab which is a large, you probably know, the large clinical trial um, uh, looking at therapeutics for COVID-19. Um, uh, one of the arms is using uh, lupinavir, ritonavir, and one of the arms is interferon beta. At present in our site, we are uh, actively enrolling in the lupinavir, ritonavir, and not yet in the interferon beta. Um, so we are trying to use this as much as possible within a clinical trial rather than using it um, off-label, although there are maybe some people who used it. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions uh, from our audience? I see some questions in the chat, but I cannot uh, scroll down for some reason. I don't think that there are any questions. Uh, maybe I could ask you another question then uh, and give uh, the audience some time to think about other questions that they may have. How do you think that your experience with the MERS uh, outbreak over in uh, the Middle East affected the way you've treated and managed patients with COVID-19? Uh, there are many uh, lessons learned from uh, MERS-CoV in our uh, uh, hospital and in Kingdom Saudi Arabia. I think there are two levels, perhaps. One is the, the way we responded to the pandemic. Uh, I think we were very well prepared because we we had the same experience before with MERS. So the hospital preparedness, 
the response and the uh, uh, search capacity um, was uh, reasonably very well executed uh, because of the MERS-CoV um, in terms of testing, in terms of managing critical patients, increasing the number of beds, uh, triage, uh, infection control practices. I think that was uh, uh, of a great uh, value in the response. At a patient level as well, I think uh, there were a lot of experiences in, uh, from MERS-CoV that translated to COVID-19 um, with the differences that I mentioned. It's, um, um, uh, so the use of uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation, the use of uh, a high flow nasal cannula, the use of uh, uh, steroids. I think many of the questions that were raised in MERS-CoV were um, studied extensively now in COVID-19. I mean, part of this because certainly the number of cases is exponentially different and uh, involves many countries. So many of the questions that uh, were raised in MERS-CoV, uh, I think, uh, created hypotheses to be tested in the COVID-19, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased to see some conclusive answers to some of these questions. Okay, we've got one question uh, from the audience. Is there any evidence that MERS COVID infection confers cross immunity to COVID? Uh, no, um, no, there's no information about cross immunity between the two uh, infections. Um, one issue about uh, MERS-CoV is that, um, again, it's uncommon disease. So when you, in the seroprevalence studies that were done in Saudi Arabia, where most of the cases are in, in Saudi Arabia, the seroprevalence is, is very low. So actually, most people do not have antibodies against uh, MERS-CoV, uh, despite the disease being endemic, because the number of people exposed are low. Uh, the, the ones who work with the camels have higher seroprevalence, but even among these, the prevalence of antibodies uh, is low. We don't know if this protect from COVID. I, uh, um, I think it's not been studied, um, but the viruses and the, uh, the antigens are uh, somewhat different. And you probably remember uh, from early COVID-19 that the um, SARS-CoV-2 has a high similarity to SARS-CoV-1 is around like 75, 80% and around 50% genetic similarity to SARS, to, to MERS-CoV. Uh, so they are from the same family um, and there are similarities, but there are also some differences. Uh, another question that we have is from uh, 2012 to now. Do you feel that the MERS virus has changed in terms of infectivity, uh, whether it's affecting human to human transmission or virulence uh, in terms of severity of illness? So genetic studies showed some minor changes in the genetic sequence of the virus. We don't think that really has this have affected the uh, infectivity of the pathogenesis. I think the decline in number of cases over the last few years um, um, are related to more strict infection control. Lots of um, interventions were taken, for example, to get the camel uh, uh, markets outside the cities. A lot of interventions were made, and that probably helped uh, in the decline of number of cases. I think this is more likely to be, reason, be the reason for decline than the uh, behavior of the virus. The cases we see uh, from MERS-CoV remain very severe when they come to ICU. They are as severe as before. Okay. Okay, I think that there are no further questions uh, available. Uh, we'd like to thank you again uh, for your time, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule and for sharing with us this very interesting uh, study that you've done with regards to interferon as well as the lupinavir and vitonavir in uh, MERS-CoV. So thank you very much again. And uh, everybody, please stay safe and masa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye.